I'm going to change the settings now. Okay, I'm muting. Okay, cool. Good morning, everybody. Hope everyone's doing well. My name is Bree, and I'm with the COVID Command Center here at the ESC for San Francisco's Emergency Relief Operations. Thank you for joining us for the San Francisco Interface Council online brief briefing for faith leaders. And today's webinar is going to be titled Shines a Light on the Listos Emergencies Preparedness Campaign. And um, like I said before, this is hosted by the San Francisco Interface Council, and this is supported by the Joint Command Center of the San Francisco COVID Command Center. Oh, geez, my apologies. Right here. So for housekeeping, um, the audio, video, and chat will be monitored and recorded for housekeeping, training, and quality assurance. And then the audio slash video. So by default, all the participants will be muted and the video will be turned off to minimize distractions. And the setting is to, um, just for a security setting to ensure against any Zoom bombings. And then for the chat, if you have any comment or question, please submit the chat to the person that is titled Q&A and then we'll collect all of those inquiries or comments um, at the end and pass them off to Michael and he will respond to you after the meeting has concluded. And then here's a slide on getting tested. So San Francisco does offer free testing um, if you work or live in the city. So if you do feel any symptoms or if you think you have had contact with someone with any COVID-19 symptoms, please get yourself tested. And then I will pass the baton off to Michael now. Thank you, Bree, and, and thank you to the entire team, uh, the tech team that is working with us. Once again, good morning. I'm Michael Pappas, and on behalf of the San Francisco Interfaith Council, I wanna welcome you to this morning's online briefing for faith leaders. Congregations are important hubs during times of disaster, as they have the capacity to mobilize volunteers and offer vital facilities. They are also centers of trust where non-English speaking and oftentimes undocumented residents feel safe. Listos California is a grassroots disaster preparedness program that can be tailored to meet the individual needs of Spanish speaking communities. It partners with community leaders, jurisdictions, nonprofits, faith-based organizations, schools, and other community institutions to provide disaster preparedness uh, information to the Spanish-speaking community. This week's online briefing for faith leaders hosted by the San Francisco Interfaith Council and supported by the COVID Command Center's Joint Information Center virtual outreach team welcomes Listos California architect and co-chair Karen Baker, who will shine a light on this important emergency preparedness campaign in these times of the coronavirus. And now it gives me great pleasure I see your smiling face, Koshi, uh, to introduce the chairman of the board of the San Francisco Interfaith Council, Koshi Roy. Thank you, Michael. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Koshik, and as the chair of the board, it is my pleasure uh, on behalf of the board of directors to thank all of you for joining us again this morning. Uh, it has been the council's honor to be a weekly part uh, of everyone's schedules, hopefully. I was talking to someone the other day, and they were commenting just how thoughtful and engaging these conversations have been, and, and today will be the same, of course. So uh, if anyone here is joining us for the first time, I want to give a special welcome to you uh, and at the beginning of each interfaith uh, event or uh, meeting there is an interfaith statement that we like to read so I'll read that now and then we'll continue. This is an interfaith community. Whatever our individual belief, it can be freely expressed here with no apologies. If we are invited to offer a prayer in this setting, it should be offered according to the tradition with which we identify. If we are invited to speak on a subject from the perspective of our tradition, we are free to do so without 
fear of offending those who come from another tradition. We come together as people of faith to learn from each other that we might better understand the multiplicity of faith traditions in our city and in our world. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Koshik. Uh, we are very blessed to have with us Deacon G.L. Hodge, uh, past chair of the Interfaith Council and, and uh, former administrator for Providence Baptist Church. GL uh, has many in incredible uh, gifts, uh, but, but one of them has been just a passion for and, uh, and, and a desire to make congregations these important hubs for uh, uh, responding to disasters. We've asked uh, Deacon Hodge to ground us in a meditative moment this morning. GL, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It is such an honor to be here. This is such an honor for the uh, work that we are trying to do as individuals. And it's very important for the work that we're doing as congregations, congregations leaders, and uh, community activists. Take a few moments, take a deep breath. Look inside your heart. And we shall move forward with the work that we have to do. Heavenly Father, we come to you this day, giving praise, honor, and thanks for letting us have the mindset to work with our communities. Letting us have the mindset to bring people together. Let us have the mindset for telling the truth, which doesn't happen all the time in these days and time. But Lord, let us have the mindset to work with each other. This is a battle that we can't win by ourselves. This is a battle that we can only work together and accomplish the goals that are needed. Let us remove the individual from this conversation. Let us look forward to what is going to happen, not what is happening. Lord, I'm from Texas. I grew up in the Mexican community. I grew up with under school with Chicanos. I grew up working with people of all color in a segregated community. But I knew one thing that as long as we trusted in each other, as long as we trusted and put God first, that we could accomplish anything. I come from a community where we wanted to represent ourselves on a football team and they wouldn't even let us wear the colors that we wanted to wear. We went to the coach's house to protest and they locked us up. So I've been advocating for a long time, but we're, what we're advocating for now is to save lives. The Mexican community has been hit very hard, harder than the community in the United States because of the social practice, because of their beliefs and family and because of the multi-generational stand in the same house. But this still shouldn't be a recipe. The recipe is to work together. The recipe is to bring all congregations together, all leaders together, and, and come up with a plan to help every individual that need it. And the only way that you can help every individual is that every individual is prepared, know the things that they need to do to move forward, know the things that they need to do for their kids when something happens, know the things that they need to do for their families when something happens. We're not going to say, and what we're doing now comes down to what I've always have said throughout the years. If the government won't do it, if the city won't do it, then we will do it and we will do it as individual we will do it at one at a time we will come together to show that love we will come together and pass out that information we'll come together and work on a common cause and our common cause is to live 
if we don't work on this, we will die. This virus is killing people every day. And the same practices that we have in disaster preparedness is the same practices that we need to fight this COVID virus. So I just come praying, saying, Lord, help us. Lord, show us. Lord, let us do whatever has to be done to make sure that we save the lives of our community. The most vulnerable people that can't help themselves, our seniors, our children, and our families. This is what my prayer is for today, that we come up with a common cause, a common strategy, a common love for each other, and we will move forward in this endeavor. God bless you, God loves you, and I do too, amen. Amen. Thank you, Deacon Hodge. And I would also ask if we could keep in prayer today uh, the soul of uh, Father Jerry O'Rourke, one of the founders of the Interfaith Council uh, who passed away last night. Uh, he, he was one of the pioneers in interfaith in San Francisco, and, uh, and we, we, we ask that his memory be a blessing. Moving from the sad to the joyous, I have the unique uh, privilege of being able to introduce a very dear friend uh, and also somebody who has journeyed with this Interfaith Council uh, in, in her work. Uh, as, as Karen Baker knows, and she has been entrusted by governors on both sides of the aisle, uh, that the Interfaith Council was born out of two crises, a homeless crisis uh, and also the Loma Prieta earthquake. And so for a number of years, and especially following uh, uh, the uh, Hurricane Katrina, uh, we were hosting every other year disaster preparedness workshops for congregations, and Karen attended them, spoke, and inspired us then, and I know that she's gonna inspire us now. Her work right now could not be more critical and uh, so uh, without further ado, I hand the floor over uh, to Karen Baker, the architect and co-chair of Listos, California. Well, thank you so much, Michael. And uh, good morning to all of you. It's, it's so wonderful to so see so many familiar faces. A big shout out to Heather Lee, our local uh, regional partner in San Francisco, who will be speaking a little bit later. But, um, it's just such a pleasure to be joining you all. And I think passing along some um, inspiring and I hope incredibly helpful resources as you uh, reach out as a trusted broker to your community members and uh, continue to provide um, helpful and really, I think, rich materials to keep people prepared uh, in these times, not only with COVID-19, but with natural disasters. Uh, we all know fire season is, is coming up, but uh, we're always living with the you know, risk of earthquakes, floods, and other kinds of disasters. So um, I just can't wait to uh, dive into the presentation, but want to just thank you for the invitation to speak with you all. Uh, you are doing amazing work with your communities and I know you must be exhausted because you're providing such support. So thank you on behalf of the governor for all that you're doing. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and, and turn to the PowerPoint if I can. Uh, we'll get started and I'll be taking questions at the end. Um, so let me begin with the name of this campaign. Um, it's Listos, which means ready in Spanish. And um, it was in part inspired by um, a Spanish speaking emergency preparedness campaign out of Santa Barbara, the Listos program. But this is a campaign that is for um, all people, all languages. Um, and yet we thought it was very important to name the campaign in a language other than English so that it would be the first statewide campaign that would have a non-English name to kind of really help remind us all that we're such a rich and diverse state. It's our, I think our greatest asset and um, wanted to make re really a point with that um, by really calling it Listos California. Um, I'll go ahead and run through some slides. Um, I do wanna let you know I have a co-chair. If you turn the next slide, um, his name's Justin Knighton who I've been having a great time working with. Um, 
as I know you know, uh, you can never do this work alone. And I have both, both Justin and a team of about five other, other people here at Cal OES, the Governor's Office of Emergency Services, uh, that are working on this effort. It's an 18 month effort that started in June 2019 and ends technically in December 2020. Um, and if we go to the next slide, I think it's our anthem. This is where we are unfortunately unable through YouTube to play you the 90 second video. We're giving you a 30 second one with uh, subtitles uh, with no music, I apologize. But at least it'll give you a feeling for um, this um, work. And this was kind of a, an initial video. We'll go ahead and play it. You see our website there. Um, I just wanted to let you know that has a, it's a beautiful piece of film that's usually a 90 second film. It's in um, the languages of our campaign, which are English, Spanish, Chinese, Vietnamese, Korean, Tagalog, and Hmong. Um, and just wanted to let you know that will be um, available along with many of the products that I'll be talking about today in a Dropbox that will be sent to you. Um, that will have a table of contents and then we'll have um, video footages like the anthem video as well as other things that you can share with your various congregations if you um, find it helpful. Um, I'll go ahead and go to the next slide and just kind of talk about how this whole campaign came came to be. Uh, the governor had been newly um, sworn in and really after especially the paradise um, fire recognized there needed to be um, a solid investment in making sure the most vulnerable of our community um, members were prepared in times of natural disasters. That's how it was defined at the time. So, so for wildfires, earthquake, and floods. And um, the diverse and vulnerable were um, defined as people in poverty, um, our older Californians, people with disabilities, non-English speaking, and then other diverse uh, community members, LGBTQ, um, African American, and other members of our community uh, that we have seen time after time again are um, overrepresented in um, the, the impact of any disaster um, because of the challenges that they are facing in their community, being under-resourced and, and other challenges they face. So what, we, what the governor really wanted me to do is to lead an effort um, to really create a people-centered approach. And the design originally was to have um, $50 million be given to, um, in the, as it turns out, 24 counties of which San Francisco is one. They could compete for it. And that $50 million would be spent for um, in-person, one-to-one one or one-to-group education and training on emergency preparedness for natural disasters. The work uh, got started in the San Francisco area. SF CARD was the um, community-based organization that received the main grant. Um, C that CBO then had the opportunity, if they um, so chose, to then have sub-grants that would go out to other um, community members and nonprofits that, that, that would help them reach um, those specific pockets of community that were diverse and vulnerable. Um, and so that was the design. Um, then of course, March hit in the middle of the campaign and with COVID-19. And so we pivoted and allowed this campaign to also go about educating community members about COVID-19. Again, in all the languages with materials. And, and that's what I'm here to just help you see um, how we've tried to inform and shape this campaign and then provide you with materials that you may need. Um, I'll go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, the thing that was, I think, really interesting about this campaign is how much it was informed by research. 
we did a lot of message and attitude testing. Um, we found out that it, people, 88% of our vulnerable populations didn't have to be convinced that they should get prepared. The biggest challenge is that they thought it was scary, that, that it was expensive, right? Um, these, are, these were the challenges that we faced, right? It was not that they didn't know that they should be prepared, right? Um, so we had to figure out how can we create messaging and materials that could be presented in a way that was accessible um, and, and, and would reach them in language, right? And, and reach everyone where they're at. Um, other kinds of data that we um, were able to secure was an overlap of wildfire, earthquake, and fire maps overlapped with social vulnerability factors. So another thing in your Dropbox that you'll see is San Francisco County, and you can look at your map based on whether you want to look at older Californians or um, any specific, specific vulnerability category and be able to see where is the specific risk in San Francisco County for that community? Where is it centralized, right? Where is their concentration in this, in this um, fabulous heat map that a Sac State professor helped us put together here with Cal OES. But just know that that was another piece of, of kind of the research that was done. Um, we did a lot of focus groups, both in English and Spanish, uh, we talked with all of the different types of community groups, um, with representatives to really figure out how and what were the key messages that we needed to, to get out to folks and how was the best way to communicate it. So I'll turn to some of those results. Um, another thing that helped us along the way were advisors. We have a 25 member advisory team, subject and population experts. Um, our CBOs are obviously both advisors, they know community. They in turn have um, submitted grant applications out to their community and there's 190 sub-grantees for our 24 grantees with this effort. And then you notice there the language diversity that I mentioned earlier. And then we can go to the, the next slide. So um, one thing I just have to do, because this is what we do in every community, is go over the five steps that we are communicating to everyone. And this is, if I had to have my absolute ideal ask of all of you, it would be making sure that your community members were familiar with these five steps. Um, they absolutely need to get alerts to know what to do. They can go to calalerts.org. And this is all in our disaster guide that that I'll also make available to you. But at calalerts.org, you can look up San Francisco, look up what is your specific alert that you can put onto your phone so that you can get the alerts um, that you need to be receiving. Um, making a plan to protect your people includes um, really documenting who are the people that you wanna connect with and protect or who's also protecting you. We call it the connect and protect list and also be familiar with your evacuation plan out of your community. Um, packing a go bag. Um, this means key documents, your medication lists, and we have a whole list of materials that should go into your go bag. That's when you have minimal time to be able to exit um, your, your home, apartment, your, your, your business. Um, building a stay box for when you really can't leave. It could be that because of the nature of the disaster, you need to stay in place. Many of us are familiar with that given COVID, um, so it would look a bit different. But when we originally created this content, it was with thinking about earthquakes and other kinds of disaster that it might take 72 hours before uh, a first responder can get to you and how you need to have you know, three gallons of water uh, per person in your household, along with canned goods and um, other important materials that we have on a list. But putting that all in, into a stay box in a way and in a place that's easy to get to um, so that you can at least take care of some of your most basic needs until help arrives. And then lastly, we always think it's critical to help your friends and neighbors get ready. 
Um, we all live in and have learned, I think, um, to connect with our neighbors in a pretty vibrant way during COVID. And our hope is that as you get yourself ready with these five steps, you'll in turn turn to your neighbor and assist them as well, helping them get ready. Next slide. So um, the thing that's our kind of our main piece is our disaster ready guide. It'll look strange to you. It'll look like uh, there's a mistake with it because it's actually a folded product and I'll, sh I'll show you it kind of visually here. It starts like this, opens up with different steps. I'm not gonna be able to, you don't have to read what I'm doing, but you'll note that it's um, highly visual, um, very graphic, um, really hopefully easy and kind of fun to, to work through with your family um, to fill out your disaster ready guide. And so this is one of the many products um, that we have um, as part of our ma campaign materials. Um, we also have curriculums and scripts. So if you either wanna do a five minute or a 15 minute or an hour disaster preparedness um, curriculum in your, uh, to your faith community, you would be able to um, be, be provided with all of the script and curriculum we also have some other special materials that you see on the bottom right, um, some information for immigrant communities. Um, this is a piece that was um, designed with the governor's office and multiple agencies um, because so many folks that are coming from immigrant backgrounds really need to understand how their public charge might be impacted by different um, aspects of accessing resources during the COVID-19 crisis. So we put together a special guide for immigrants um, that I think is really helpful. We've also put together a special guide for those folks with intellectual and developmental disabilities and their caretakers. Um, so you're going to see a, just a wealth of materials that you can tap and provide to, to needy community members. And next. Um, part of what we've tried to do in outreach is, um, and Heather will be able to kind of speak a little bit more about what's been going on in San Francisco, but um, what we've been encouraging is for that, that lead CBO and also partners they work with in the volunteer and service world, whether it's NERT in San Francisco, um, Alistos Chapter, which is a, a, a program um, that offers eight hours of preparedness in Spanish, um, at more of a family setting. Um, there's webinars, there's um, also our social bridging, um, which is a wonderful campaign that we're conducting in San Francisco as we speak, where we literally do phone banking to our seniors with volunteers um, and just to help deal with the social isol isolation and kind of check on their wellness while providing critical resources that they may need. Um, we have a San Francisco guide, um, county guide, that is a guide for all meeting all needs of seniors. That might be another thing we, we should provide to you just so that you would have it available as well. But at minimum, you can go to your um, county emergency management office and uh, we'll be providing it to them um, so it'll be on their website. Um, so this, this is just great as you're trying to meet the needs of whether it be food insecurity, whether it be housing questions, um, all of those kinds of issues, mental health, health, are all addressed during these wellness calls. And uh, one of my favorite calls that we've had with a, a senior, um, they're just so isolated and um, challenged. So we had one, one gentleman that gave uh, our caller a one hour, they were 92 years old, a one hour review of all disasters this gentleman had lived through while living in San Francisco. And uh, the caller just found it actually quite fascinating. And um, the gentleman just said, you know, I just haven't been able to have a long talk with someone and I just am so grateful. So sometimes it's resources and sometimes it's, it's just simple connection that, that people need. Um, but just so that's going on as part of Listos is the social bridging project. Um, we also have partnerships in broadcast and digital media um, with Univision, PBS, California Black Media, Ethnic Media Services, uh, which has a lot of our API partnerships. 
Um, so th that's going on. And then um, we have other special initiatives. Um, we've got a special conversation series that you can follow in, in, in Spanish and in English called Informa Gente, which takes celebrities and um, state leaders and they take a simple topic. It could be housing, it could be healthcare, and you'll be um, seeing a, uh, a, a wonderful celebrity of which I'm not connected to the celebrity world, but <laughs> speaking and being able to go back and forth. And then we're able to get this circulated to a much broader audience of, of people that some trust the politician, perhaps others would trust maybe the celebrity more, but it's all another way of reaching a different demographic. Um, and really important information. And we're really grateful to our celebrities who have been working uh, side by side with our state um, uh, directors and secretaries. Um, I can go to the next slide. Um, these, this just tells you the 24 counties where we have partnerships. Uh, what you see in blue, and you'll see obviously, uh, San Francisco is yellow here because it not, not only um, has received one of the 24 grants, but also has CERT Listos um, and other um, volunteer and service partners that are serving. Um, so uh, I think there's some awfully good concentration of resources in the Bay Area um, that we're, we're excited about. We've also tried to make these resources especially um, available to um, areas where there's that urban rural interface uh, where there's a lot of, frankly, a lot of disasters. Um, so there was a, this competitive process that I mentioned, but these are where our partners are. Um, partners including Catholic Charities, Public Health Institute, United Ways are often the, the lead agency. And then, as I mentioned, they have these 190 subgrantees, often that do include our faith members. Next slide. So our goal originally was to reach a million. And um, it's been very exciting to see that we've reached over 10 million. Um, and this was as of June 19th. It's probably closer to uh, 12 or 13 million at this time. Um, the number 628,425 tells you who has um, received that more intensive emergency preparedness engagement. Um, it could be anything from like an hour long session or it could be 20 hours of CERT or NERT in the Bay Area. And what the um, engage, what is the makeup of that, uh, the people that have received that? If it says not applicable, no primary ethnic target, it means that as people were doing these engagements, the, the audience that they were targeting, it was unclear what um, was the primary uh, makeup of that audience. It was, it was unknown. Um, but you'll see otherwise, I think there's been a, a good kind of intentional reach uh, by race and ethnicity, and then also engagements by vulnerability and social vulnerability. We've also been capturing, um, you know, who are we really reaching based on uh, various abilities levels, uh, if they're youth, if they're a senior, et cetera. You'll see that 10 million point, the 10.5 million are those that we reached with some special information that went out the door um, just on COVID-19. We took this same basic guide, the disaster ready guide and created a public health guide that was just earmarked specifically for that. Um, so that's another thing that's um, available to you in your Dropbox. And if we can turn the page. So these are some upcoming um, materials. There's gonna be some special materials for wildfire season. There's also gonna be some um, specific materials created for um, our um, people experiencing homelessness, which we think is a really important um, new product. Um, a development of the, the text curriculum is out there right now. Um, you can, within um, a five day period, get a text a day it takes you through the five steps. Um, and I believe that's seven by texting seven, two, three, four, five. 
and it's Listos CA, L-I-S-T-O-S-C-A. And you can access um, a text curriculum online um, that just takes a few minutes each day and will um, help you get uh, ready. Um, so just know that's uh, out there. Our web-based um, training will also be delivered within the next week or two. Um, we're having a major partnership with Ralph's, Rayleigh's, Safeway, all the grocery stores, with CalFresh, with all of them, um, everyone in the kind of the food distribution business is going to be, um, we're going to be releasing a major Listos California education campaign uh, for that is often um, the, the one avenue that people are going out for is, is food. Um, and obviously we're going to be increasing visibility through the media, um, ongoing partnerships. And then September, because it's preparedness month, will be a very big kind of blowout where every day of the month we'll have a different event or population that we're focusing on and really telling the story and getting that community prepared so it could be Native Americans one day, it could be a focus on um, NERT and CERT. Uh, there's all kinds of different um, subgroups that we're gonna be showcasing, but just wanted to let you know about that. And then our next slide. Um, this is what we're, we're really encouraging. And this was a slide when we were talking to elected officials. So forgive the word constituents. Um, it should be like reaching your community members, but. We really hope that you can talk about the five steps. Um, let, you know, obviously tap the campaign tools. This is a Dropbox um, that is the same one that we will be forwarding directly to you. And then hold or participate in training events. And I know Heather will have some great thinking on this and Michael and um, promote the activities of, of Listos California and our listoscalifornia.org um, website um, that there will be a fresh one that's up in about a week that will be mind-blowing but even the one that's up now has some of the critical information on it and next slide and this is just my contact information um, I will let you know that phone number I will not pick up that phone <laughs> so it's best to just reach me uh, with caloes.ca.gov uh, too many calls coming in, so uh, we've just gone to email, um, but please do be in touch if I can help in any way. Um, and just thank you very much for your time and attention and look forward to your questions. Karen, we can't thank you enough. I mean, the information that you've imparted is, has not only been comprehensive, a little overwhelming. Uh, yeah. And so what we, are, what we intend to do, all of the contacts uh, and resources that uh, Karen referenced, will be sent out with the recording link by day's end today. And we're encouraging all of our listeners, both on here and, and our 5,000 e-subscribers who will receive this uh, to uh, open it up like a, like a gift and, and, uh, and use it uh, with, as a resource for, for your faith communities. What well, Michael, if I could say one thing, one sure. thing that's kind of shocking to me, but I have to just mention it, a lot of communities weren't getting prepared because um, there weren't free and accessible information uh, available. You often had to pay for a, for a disaster kit or for a preparedness training. So this is the first time that we're seeing, um, you know, data driven in language, you know, preparedness information made available to the public for free. So there can be no reason why anyone can't get prepared uh, because it's accessible now. And so we just think that's a, a major and important move and I appreciate your help in, in distributing it to the membership. Well, I just wanted to tell you, Karen, you know, since the outset of the COVID, you know, I've been invited along with some faith folk from throughout the state to be on calls uh, just to keep us apprised of what's out there. So the things that Karen has shared with us today I think among the reports that are given in those sessions that the Listos report has been the most exciting for me. And so it, to have you with us today to be able to share this uh, with, our, with our good folk it is a blessing. It really is a blessing. You're welcome. One of the things that, um, that you lifted up and GL lifted up is that we can't do this alone. And so uh, we have invited, I'm going to call it the A-team. Um, 
and uh, and uh, to to be with us today. Uh, you know, since uh, in, in our disaster preparedness work, we have partners in disaster preparedness uh, with whom we we collaborate on everything from earthquakes to fires to security and houses of worship, and um, and uh, the, we've asked each of our panelists to limit their remarks to five minutes and then to ask a question of you for a response. So it will be interactive in that way. The mm -hmm. first of our panelists is Daniel Holmesy. He's the director of the Neighborhood Empowerment Network. Uh, no stranger to you, Karen, and, and a, a great friend of the council. I can think of no person in the city and county of San Francisco who knows not only every neighborhood, but every road in this city and uh, and the work that Daniel has been doing with communities of faith in particular neighborhoods uh, has been impressive and it's it's really a privilege to have him with us today. Uh, the resilient Daniel Holmesy. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, yeah, well, thank you, Michael. Very glowing reviews. I appreciate that um, uh, of the my contributions to the work, but uh, I, I do want to just say that um, it really is uh, about bringing people together and creating a collective vision. And, and the San Francisco Interfaith Council is perhaps one of the shining examples of that. And, and to be honest, when I go to other cities and they say, well, how can we do what you're doing in San Francisco? The first thing I say is like, do you have an interfaith council? And it's remarkable how many cities don't. And, you know, Karen and I have talked about this. It's, if, if you can't get the faith community to be part of your backbone, because some of the communities that she elevated that are priorities really trust the faith community perhaps more than other communities. Um, you've got a lot of work ahead of you. Um, and so the Neighborhood Empowerment Network, for those that may not be familiar with our work, is a city initiative. It's uh, chaired in the city administrator's office led by a, a city administrator, Naomi Kelly, of course. And it was created uh, early on by a young man uh, who went on to achieve some level of success uh, Mayor Gavin Newsom, who really did see that uh, it really is important to have strong, thriving cross-sector network partners at the community level, uh, not just during a disaster, but every day. And, and every day, every community is experiencing some kind of stress or disaster. So it may not have Anderson Cooper standing in the middle of chaos with a microphone, uh, but it may be a residential fire. It may be an act of violence. It may be a myriad of things which has health impacts on the community that may not get on the news, but it's certainly impacting people's hearts and minds and livelihoods. And communities that can come together around those challenges are optimally positioned to work with, you know, the city and the state on the big challenges. Um, and so those small events actually ultimately become the primer to succeed during the big events. Um, the Neighborhood Empowerment Networks program called the Empower Communities Program, we basically, we go into a neighborhood and as GL Hodge will tell you, because I have it on tape, you know, we go in with a blank piece of paper and we just start asking questions. And we say, you know, who do you care about? What kind of risks are you concerned about? How can we help you prepare for those risks and to protect your most vulnerable neighbors? And I think to Karen's point, it's remarkable how much people already know what their risks are, know what they need to do. You know what they lack? They lack the resources, right? They lack the t someone coming in and supporting them. If you want to build a more thriving local economy, there are 75 nonprofits and 65 city programs that will come in and, you know, invest in that. But when it comes to disaster resilience, up until very recently, it was really hard to find uh, a program and organization with that come in and provide sustained support. Um, so with that, I want to elevate the work of the San Francisco Interfaith Council. It, it has from day one uh, been focused on this. And if it weren't for Michael Pappas, Many of the relationships I have in the faith community um, would not be in place. And one of the first communities that Michael and I partner on was the Bayview community. And that's where we met uh, GL Hodge. And GNL and I have gone on to work on some amazing opportunities together with our partner, Felicia Thibodeau. But all that was anchored in Providence Baptist Church, which is one of the most respected organizations in the Bayview. And that credibility gave us a platform to move forward. Um, and then, of course, through that, we met our good friends over at SF Card, and Heather Lee is here, but of course, Brian Litlow as well. And their work with the faith community today to help organizations and congregations be better prepared for times of stress to protect the health and well-being of their staff and their congregants is groundbreaking. And so 
you know, you can see how this is sort of a daisy chain of relationships that cumulatively manifest on today's call. Uh, while Listos is a new campaign, uh, Karen is not an, uh, certainly not an old face to our work. She has been around for uh, over a decade, Cal volunteers, day one, just completely supportive, energy-wise, passion-wise, but also brilliance, you know, and brilliance is her resilience, right? She sees through all the chaos every day, and believe me, there's a lot in Sacramento. Uh, and she certainly sees how this hits the street, and we're really blessed to have her and Justin working on this program because they truly understand how to translate uh, a very complex mission at the state level to the community level. Um, and I'm, of course, really proud of the work of the governor because, let's face it, uh, Gavin Newsom, the first day on the job in San Francisco, convened the Disaster Council. Um, and let's face it, the first thing he did at the state level was put an unprecedented amount of money into preparedness, $70 million, um, and also strengthening the team at Cal OES to be focused on community resilience. So all the pieces are in place right now. The, the secret is now how do we bring our community partners into this system? And the Listos program is a fantastic effort in that capacity. And the fact that they're going after the, one of the hardest to reach communities first is the reason why it's a success. Because the bottom line is that community has been waiting for someone to call them and say, you know what, we want to be there for you when you need us the most. And that's what's going on. I do want to take one second, Michael, and just say to honor our faith-based partners that you know I work with, Providence Baptist Church, St. Aidan's Church, Holy Innocence, St. Anne's, Temple Emmanuel, Noe Valley Ministries, Grace Lutheran, and Trinity Baptist Church, to name a few. Those are all very strong partners in our communities. And not just letting us use a community room and, and saying lock the door on the way out, but the congregants and the lay um, and, the, and the pastor leaders themselves at the table, seeing how community faith is really about community resilience. And they've actually seen that working on this issue has strengthened their connectivity with community around them and made their congregation richer and, and better prepared um, at the same time. So, so many layers of benefit to this work that go beyond just handing out a kit what you're really doing is empowering people to thrive every day. And if we can do that as a state, we can get through this COVID-19 um, experience. We're going to tragically probably lose more people than we think is reasonable and acceptable. But in the other end, if at least the one thing that comes out of it is that we're more connected and we can lean forward on the bigger challenges that are facing our public health, then you know what? That's at least honoring those who we lost during the period. But if we don't come out of it with something positive to focus on, then we doubled down on our failure. And again, I wanna thank Karen for her constancy during this process. A lot of government programs would roll over and wait till it was over. She leaned in, revisioned herself, and with partnerships with like Heather Lee here, who's brilliant as well, the city is blessed. The project I'm working on here in the city with the Least Dose program is a program that Karen and I have discussed many times called the Neighbor Fest program. And what we do is we basically figured out how to take the world famous block party and turn it into a high capacity building event that prepares local teams to care for their neighbors during times of stress. And as we saw during COVID-19, for a lot of seniors and people with access and functional needs, if their neighbor didn't knock on their door and offer to go get them groceries, then they didn't get groceries. And so we're very excited about the prospects of the Neighbor Fest program. With Cal OES, it's already been spread across the state to cities like Santa Rosa, Bishop, California, and going beyond that to the coastline as well. And we hope to resume that work um, very quickly um, in the partnership with SF Card and Livable Cities. With that, I want to ask my one question for Karen. Sure. Karen, I think we all recognize that we've almost entered into a new era, which is disasters in the time of COVID, right? And uh, and many of you may know that uh, I actually helped respond to support the migrant farm worker community in Cloverdale, California during last year's wildfires, where over 700 migrant farm workers uh, presented themselves at the county fairgrounds in town and were um, basically looking for support and there was no professional infrastructure there. The Red Cross and other folks were deployed in other areas and the community had to come together and feed these families for three days. And it was a marvelous example of how incredible small towns are and how great their built-in civic networks um, can perform. The reality is this year, they want, they're working to prepare for it again, and we're, of course, supporting that. But the truth is, is that in the, under the conditions of COVID-19, with physical distancing and all the other relation issues regarding PPE, having 700 people in a half-acre lot uh, was not a problem before, but presents a new layer of challenges for folks that are trying to 
prevent the spread of COVID-19, but in the response to a wildfire event, which requires often people coming together in a congregant location. I just wanna know how you're thinking through that um, and many messaging that you're advancing to empower communities that wanna support the mission at the same time, protect the health and well-being of their volunteers and the people they care about. Wow. <laughs> There's a lot there. Great question. Um, so if I, I miss elements of it, I, I want you to um, let me know. Um, <laughs> first of all, on the migrant farm worker front, I know that um, we've had to go out, and I personally have been in migrant camps doing door-to-door -door education because that's what you have to do. You have to get out there in the community, uh, knock on the door, talk with the family members that are so worried about either admitting if they're starting to have symptoms because they're afraid they'll get kicked out of the housing, they'll lose their livelihood. Um, it's, it's an extremely um, precarious situation in, um, for that set of our community members. Um, we've been working in a really bold partnership with the Mexican consulates. Um, we just did a training with over uh, 2,500 Mex Mexican consulate community members and the consulates are kind of trusted by um, people from Mexico, right? Because they are there for them. And um, so um, we're right now doing some both training with the consulate as a partner at different um, farm worker community um, um, gatherings um, that we deem safe um, or that they can go in or we can go in and do um, some uh, dissemination of information that's safe. Um, that's kind of one way that we've tried to kind of deal with that. We're also dealing with the farmers and the growers and the vineyards, uh, depending on your, your industry. And we're now producing some new materials that will have COVID-19 on one half in a wallet guide and on the other half wildfire uh, preparedness information. Uh, that also applies to all kinds of disaster preparedness. So this wallet guide will be handed out to farm workers um, by um, the farm, the farmers themselves or ranchers, et cetera. So that's a partnership with Secretary um, Ross of the California Department of Food and Ag. So there's, there's all kinds of kind of vibrant partnerships that are trying to reach that population. Um, I don't know if, I, I think I've honed in on that piece of what you said, but you may have um, asked There's other one other piece that I heard, and that was people coming together in congregate settings mm. during this COVID-19. If you could address that quickly, because we have to go on to our other two guests. Sure. I mean, I think the, the only thing I can suggest is in that Dropbox of materials, there, there is scripts, curriculum, video, materials, um, and even maybe Heather can speak a bit to about, you know, for those congregations that might need printed materials that they find uh, more helpful to get out to their community members through a mailing. Um, there, there, there are resources that we can get out to congregations. It's just a question of, you know, uh, how, what, what works for your community? Is it digital? Is it a mailing? Um, is it a phone call? You know, you're gonna need to let us know the best way of reaching um, your community, but just know that there's both state partners and as you can see, local partners that stand ready to help with that. Fantastic. You know, we've heard the name Heather Lee uh, mentioned <laughs> multiple times. She's gonna become a cult figure. Um, I, I will say um, that the organization that she represents, SF Card, Community Agencies Responding for dis to, dis to Disaster, the Interfaith Council was one of, we, we were the first fiscal sponsor for SF Card back in the day. And since then, SF Card has been an incredible partner of the councils. When we host our disaster preparedness workshops for congregations, realizing our own capacity, we direct and steer people to SF Card for training. I know, Heather, right now, uh, you are playing a very unique role vis-a-vis -vis Listos, and we was wondering if you could spend a few moments sharing that with us and, and then posing a question uh, to Karen Baker. Absolutely, thank you, Michael, Karen, Daniel, John. 
I'm sitting here with all the famous people. Um, feeling a little, a little, a little shocked by that. Um, you know, Karen, I just want to thank you so much for calling into this meeting today and talking to everyone about Listos. You've done so much of my work for me. Thank you. Um, as many of you know, uh, back when this campaign started, uh, back last July, um, SF Card and the Interfaith Council were both concerned and actively working on helping faith communities address concerns about violent intruders. And we've been looking into ways to supporting additional training and keeping our members safe in those frightening circumstances. That was so long ago. <laughs> Um, in fact, the Interfaith Council meeting that I was going to introduce a Listos funded uh, campaign to really address that and go into congregations and work on that. Um, the day before, I was actually at the partner meeting in Oakland with Listos, got a call from Michael and um, was asked to give up my spot to the Department of Public Health to talk about this new novel virus. It doesn't feel very novel anymore. <laughs> So now we have this intruder, this microscopic intruder um, that keeps us apart um, and life continues and the work goes on. Um, and you know, it's really a blessing to have Zoom and to have these opportunities and really to have this funding for the ways that we can come together and look at how that happens. So I gotta say again, I'm so glad Karen that you have shared all this material with everyone all at once. You've made my life so much easier. Um, as we at SF Card um, and the other partners are looking at ways to uh, reach into those vulnerable communities via the faith, the faith communities that they trust so much. Um, so, um, and I gotta say, I'm really glad. This is me because I do have my moment of fame. Staybox was my idea. <laughs> you laughing. It was mine. Um, a, a beautiful, amazing woman in a wheelchair living in one of the apartments at Conard House. I was doing a disaster training and she said, how am I supposed to take all of this stuff? What am I supposed to do, you know, if I need to evacuate or stay? And we sat there and came up with the difference between a go bag and a stay box and, and nailed, you know, came up with those terms, but really delineated those things, which is something in my own trainings that I had not I had not made clear before for people. Um, always learning, we're always learning. Um, so, you know, I'm looking forward to working with Michael, with the Interfaith Council, with anybody who is on this call today with us um, in finding ways to share the resources that are being presented today with the members of our faith communities. Um, and, you know, I personally know how hard it is to get Karen on the phone. So now that I have you, now that I have you, I want to ask if you have any suggestions for how our faith communities can share and act on, because sharing the disaster guide itself is not enough, yeah. um, but how we can share and act on the opportunities that Listos provides. I mean, I think what I would do, I, I think about, um, I happen to be Catholic and actually um, go to church and all kinds of uh, unusual things. <laughs> but uh, I know that at least in my faith community, um, my priest at the end of a service could easily say, I haven't even asked him, I should my own, my own priest, but could say, you know, for those of you who would like um, to join us, we're going to be going over some preparedness information and either you decide for your congregation, does it lend itself to a, the five minute version, the 15, the hour, um, and say, and we, we can send out or mail to you the disaster guides ahead of time, but we'd like to go ahead and present this information to you so you can get these important tips and start applying them. Because one thing that's really interesting, I forgot to mention this, which is probably not a surprise, the main reason that people get prepared is because they've experienced a disaster. Well, now the entire state has experienced a disaster, in this case, a pandemic. And in an odd way, it is much more, people are much more likely to be interested in getting prepared, especially because what we've learned is we need to present preparedness as an empowering me you know, message like you can keep you and your family safe, you and your network of friends safe, as opposed to, oh, that scary wildfire earthquake could happen. 
you know, be prepared. That doesn't seem to work as effectively as an empowering message that says, you know, you've got to, you know, make sure that your family has what it needs. Um, and this is a way to, to get that information out there. So that's what I would encourage people to do. And then I would really encourage figuring out a way of reporting those numbers, whether it's up to, to the Interfaith Council, it then gets reported to Heather or to Heather directly. We're really wanting to count all the numbers of the people that have been educated. Um, it's part of the story of that 11 million plus. And in San Francisco, we need to be able to, to count those numbers. So I would encourage you to figure out what works for your congregation and then work with either through the Interfaith Council or Heather to figure out how those could be tabulated and put into our, our data management system, Merit. Thank you. And, and I just wanna to say to both Karen and to Heather that uh, because disaster preparedness is in the DNA of the council, that uh, we are committed to working with SF Card, our partner, and, and, and helping get the word out to our 800 uh, communities of faith and religious institutions in San Francisco. Thank you, Heather. And I know that we have a lot of work to do. Um, <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> Always. This, this brings us, you know, I, I, I see my friend G.L. Hodge today, and he's usually wearing a hat. Uh, and he's got lots of hats. Uh, uh, the only person that I know that rivals him in wearing hats is John McKnight who in the, in the time that I've known him has worn a number of different hats. Uh, John, in addition uh, to formerly being the lead uh, disaster uh, liaison with Salvation Army, uh, uh, has, is the treasurer of the board of the San Francisco Interfaith Council. And during the COVID-19 has really been recognized for his gifts and has been entrusted with uh, coordinating the community branch for the Department of Emergency Management's uh, uh, work. And uh, I, I am very grateful for that. I will tell you, because there's been mention of the wildfires, that, uh, you know, we realized how regional everything is uh, in terms of when there's a disaster in San Francisco, uh, it, it impacts everybody around us and vice versa. Uh, and uh, so John was really a, an important lead uh, in bringing us all the counties, the neighboring counties together during the, the California wildfires, which really revealed some of the, the concerns of the immigrant community in, in getting help and getting medical assistance. Um, I'm not gonna take any more of the stage uh, because John is playing a very, very important role right now. Uh, John, uh, talk to us. Thank you and good morning, Michael. And good morning, Karen. I, uh, I have the pleasure of sitting with you at this stage of my life with over 30 years in emergency management that began in federal service with the US military, has been in corporate, in our nonprofit, and more recently in civic. And it's a very interesting position to be in now working for the city of San Francisco. I have the great pleasure of leading what is now referred to as the outreach branch. And I have about 50 people working for me right now. Some of them are the ones that distribute the posters you see throughout the city, all those beautiful blue and gold posters, go Navy. I don't want to really pick up on that, but for those of you who know, I'm a Navy veteran and I have no kick that our, our posters are Navy colors. Sorry to the Marines out there. But uh, I also maintain the team that is doing the meeting you are sitting on right now. And our mission in managing these meetings is because we are in a disaster of isolation, we needed to set up a technical squad to be able to bring communities together to ensure that the communities throughout San Francisco had a voice here at the Emergency Operations Center. Part of what a community branch is in any organization is the avenue, the channel for community organizations to have a seat in an emergency operations center where they don't normally uh, operate. And it's been a pleasure to be that channel of that voice, to sit in the back, to listen to the people of our city, hear what their needs are and funnel those needs up to our policymakers. And in all of that, we hear a lot of things we expect and more importantly, we hear the things that we don't expect. And in this disaster, with people locked behind closed doors, hearing what their needs are is pretty empowering. Uh, and I will bring to you here, Karen, the, uh, I'm grateful to hear the work you're doing. I was really touched to hear that you're going door to door in uh, 
in the peoples where they're living and to speaking to them directly. That is amazing work. And I would love to hear more about your experiences out there. I would, that's some, that's gotta be something to I have a lot of stories I'm sure to share. But one of the challenges all of us always meet, especially in emergency management is keeping the message relevant. And in every disaster we've ever prepared for, all of us, we've talked about disasters that maybe last week's now, granted, the long-term recovery would last much longer, but the messaging we need to help people prepare is usually over with within a month, maybe two. We're talking about a year now. How are you planning to keep your messaging relevant as we know that we need to refresh that messaging over time to keep people engaged? And do you have a strategy for updating that messaging as we progress further into the year with this ongoing COVID crisis? And thank you. Yeah, great question. Um, there's a couple of strategies that we have. Um, first of all, the messaging absolutely has to change and it has already changed. We had a message in March that was, of course, stay home, save lives. Then it pivoted to your actions, save lives, meaning wear a mask, social distancing, became <laughs> much more of an important message. Um, and I'm sure it will pivot again, right? It, it, it you just, the, the, the most important thing is, I think, having partners and a budget that lets you, lets you have the flexibility to invest in the change of message. So luckily, because of our $50 million budget that includes a communications budget, if I have billboards up throughout the state, which I'll, I'll be having it within a week, that are gonna, you're gonna see people in blue masks that say listos, which means ready, looks like this, right? Um, and you're gonna see that because that's the theme for that a couple month period. But then I have budget that I can then pivot from bus stops, billboards, um, posters. We're, we're also recognizing you know, ethnic grocery stores um, neighborhood grocery stores are one of the most important <laughs> places to get messaging. So forging a major partnership with all of them, you know, we started with the association of grocers thinking up at the top, kind of the way state often does. And then, no, 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 I used to run a homeless agency. So maybe that's where my heart is more in the nonprofit world, but no, no, go to the, go to the grassroots and start talking to the ethnic grocery stores in communities get them posters that they can hang that has the five steps, that has some simple covid19.ca.gov, like the website that you can go to to get COVID-19 guidances. So there's what we call evergreen messaging that has to stay no matter what, which is like certain websites, but then you do need that fresh thing. Uh, an another tactic we have found is realizing that in different communities, um, they're going to respond to different styles of messaging, right? And the message has to change. So having the Informa Gente conversation series has been great because the, the topics can change. You can have fresh content. You can do a, a 15 minute or a five minute interview, have it up on, on, on and then start promoting it. So I, I would recommend methods like that uh, that are less costly because you can just get it out through um, social, you know. So we've done a lot on, in the social space to just keep things fresh. But like I, I have to admit to you, I've, I've never, I've, I'm used to running very, very poor nonprofits. And to finally have um, money to spend on vulnerable communities, it, it's, just, it's just never done. It, it's not usual. So that's what helps. You can, you can pay for phenomenal creative, great design um, that you couldn't otherwise pay for that helps, but you don't need it. I, I also know that, like you noted, it's that going in uh, into the door and talking in the home, you know, with a family where you really find out what's going on, right? Um, we're also going to have some new video um, that's going out that captures the voices of preparedness and the need from the black community. A, a great uh, black director, Michael Payton is gonna be um, 
producing and putting that out. Also with the Latino community, we're, we're doing these different, very targeted media spots as well to reach different community members. So I know that's a complicated answer, but it's a, a lot of little things. It, it's an important answer and, and we thank you. And we thank you, John, for the question. Uh, I, I would just say to Karen, you know, a role that the Interfaith Council has been playing since the outset of the pandemic has been conveyor of official communications, aggressive recommendations, public health orders, and getting clarification. This has been critical for our faith leaders so that they can make good judgments in terms of, of, of caring for those who, souls who have been entrusted to their care. And right. what you've shared with us today uh, is going to add to the richness of the resources that we are gonna be conveying because really houses of worship are hubs for the most vulnerable residents in our city and county. So we thank you. We thank you for joining us. And I'm hoping that this is the beginning of a conversation and not the end of one. I wanna say special thank you to, to Kushik and to GL Hodge, Daniel Holmesy, Heather Lee and John McKnight. Uh, you've all helped to create a beautiful mosaic today. Uh, again, just the beginning. Uh, we have a lot of work to do and we need to roll up our sleeves. As we're saying thank you, I, I would be remiss if I did not thank Cynthia Zambukas, who really has uh, been an amazing uh, support and resource and my right and left hand, uh, as well as our COVID Command Center's Joint Information Virtual Outreach Team. Uh, of course, John, wearing two hats today, uh, is, the, is the coordinator. Uh, and we thank producer Brianna Zen, who was assisted by Lynn Mays, Emerging Needs Lead, uh, Christine Salai, and our other team members, uh, Sharon Walton and Jack Chen. Without you, we couldn't be doing this. This was our 16th uh, in the series. Um, and we welcome you next week and encourage you to join us as we shine a light on the impact of COVID-19 on gun violence in our city. Uh, so that should be a very, very engaging program. Uh, this concludes today's program. Again, we will be sending out this recording and all of the resources by day's end. So thank you all and God bless you. Thank you so much.